Hey fam. Okay. I I like to come on here and uh talk about the that couple that we saw waving that those uh, that AR fifteen and that woman with her uh what was it, her Glock that she had. Um actually uh there's there's an article, I gotta share this. And it says, a white man waving an AR-15 around in front of his mansion says much more about America than you think. Images of Mark and Patricia McCloskey appeared, armed appearance before their St. Louis home were immediately striking and quickly slipped around the country and the world. But a white couple brandishing weapons in defense of property reflects an ugly history of racial violence and exclusion that has deepened a seated, all too present hatred, actually, writes Patrick Blanchfield, an academic and journalist whose work focuses on gun violence. They stand next to each other, a white couple in their 60s. He wears Salmon Brooks Brothers polo. Tucked into his khakis, her, a casual white and black striped shirt. Both are barefoot. Both are armed. Him with an AR rifle, which he holds by the grip and then by the handguard. Her with a shiny little auto, semi-automatic pistol with her finger on the trigger, which is a hell of a no-no. You know anything about gun safety and... Um, Appropriate gun handling to keep your finger on the trigger. I mean, that never mind. Let me just keep going. Yelling and gesturing, they sweep the crowd of protesters before them, pointing the barrels of their weapons at one another repeatedly in the process. In the torrent of arresting news footage, Mark and Patricia McCloskey. Standing outside their 18,000 square foot in uh, St. Louis mansion has become iconic since they were filmed confronting protesters on June 29th. The memes have been non stop. There was even an inevitable presidential retweet, but beyond the immediate partisan division, social media churn, and TV news hits. Sunday scene condensed into an image of history of struggles over race, guns, private property, and public space that are as old as the U.S. itself and are playing out again right before our very eyes. St. Louis has always been a flashpoint for most of the elemental struggles and traumas of the American story. Its growth on the banks of the Mississippi River tracks successive waves of colonialization, ethnic cleansing, domination, and expropriation. My mama's from St. Louis. My grandmama, St. Louis, via Kosciuszko, Mississippi. For centuries, the region was the heartland of highly sophisticated indigenous civilizations of the so-called mound builders or Mississippians. The region's geographic advantage in turn drew European traders. After the Louisiana Purchase, the city became a launching pad for white exploration and settlement. A beachhead from which western governors coordinated Indian removal and scorched earth campaigns of extermination. Huh. In 1836, it was the site of arguably the first recorded lynching of a black man in the U.S. Now, after the Civil War, St. Louis was a hotbed for Klan activity. My mom used to tell me about the Klan and their man. Um, well, well, stories that she told me about them riding through the 
town at night or riding through the cities um, and trying to scare people. Or actually, they were terrorizing people. Wasn't no trying to scare to it. They terrorized them. Um, you know, hmm, it's interesting. After the Civil War, again, St. Louis was a hotbed for Klan activity. It was became a booming railway hub and manufacturing center. Private corporations and state authorities worked together to develop new tactics for crushing labor unrest and maintaining ever starker inequality. Glittering mansions not far from shanties, dormitories, and flop houses. In 1916, the city was the first in the U.S. to pass a racial segregation law by popular referendum. In 1917, Days of Race Riots, essentially programmed led by whites, where anywhere from 40 to well more than 250 black, blacks dead, blocks of black residents burned and thousands of black families without homes. See, that's why it's important for y'all to know y'all history because Black Street, Wall Street wasn't the only place that was burned down by white mob uh, or government factions like the move. And I think I'm going to do the next video is going to be done about the move in Philadelphia. And I hope those of y'all who remember the move, like Tafrica, I know you do. Um, PLL, some of y'all who are pretty knowledgeable about some of the stuff that happened before, I want y'all to chime in on what you remember about the move and Frank Rizzo. Um, <laughs> man, in Philadelphia, you talking about a race baiter. I mean, anyway, today St. Louis is generating new public, uh, a public scene of unrest. Six years after the killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Black Lives Matter protesters are once again, once more in the streets. On Sunday, they sought to picket the home of St. Louis Mayor Linda Cruzan in response to her reading on Facebook Live the names and addresses of constituents who wrote to her in support of defunding the police pro uh, doxing them. I ain't that something. That's what the St. Louis mayor did. She needs to step down. She doxed them. She needs to go. See that shit? Y'all got, you know, all this stuff got to be called out and I hope y'all don't let up in the loop. According to many protesters, evading road blockages en route took them past the toy mansions of the civil West End neighborhood where the McCloskeys live. Although those homes are served by public utilities, an area includes many private streets, a phrase that could be called indicative of St. Louis's urban planning. Ain't that some shit? Private streets, huh? With your money. This arrangement is both an artifact of the late 19th century when industrialists sought to create proto-gated communities and in the 1970s and 80s when the city officials sought to lure wealthy residents back into the city after white flight of the 50s and 60s. Reports differ on whether and how the protesters entered the area, but as they streamed down the street, McCloskey and his wife met them on the front lawn with their guns drawn. McCloskey explained that I was a person scared for my life. I feared for my life. Protected my wife, my home, my heart, my livelihood. I was a victim of a mob that came through the gate. He also said that he was assaulted and that he really thought it was storming the Bastille. Although what exactly he meant assaulted or what he meant by the Bastille analogy 
are unclear. Well, let me tell you, I can, I can, I can tell you what he meant. He meant assaulted because they walked through. He meant how dare them. And Bastille, he uh, referred to the Mexicans. Right? Don't take a rocket science to know that. Video of the scene does not appear to show any armed protesters. Although some may have been, reports on this also differ. But it does not show any, nor does it appear to show any protesters stepping off the private street onto his lawn. In fact, video shows protesters holding their hands up, telling McCloskey not to shoot, and trying to de-escalate the situation by moving along and pushing others along. Come on, let's go. Parsing what happened in terms of the law really gets kind of murky fast. As U.S. states go, Missouri is quite liberal in terms of gun rights. An open carry of farm, firearms is legal. Missouri is also a castle doctor state, allowing homeowners to make armed self-defense of their residents against invaders. The state does not impose a duty to retreat, meaning gun owners can shoot, they aren't required to flee from their homes or elsewhere if they feel their lives are under imminent threat. So that's kind of known as, uh, you know, to stand your ground. Right? But brandishing a weapon at someone in, threat, in a threatening manner can be a felony. And the castle doctrine does not straightforwardly extend to private streets. Indeed, St. Louis City laws regarding brandishing at people in shared public spaces in a more common language sense may well trump the prerogatives, prerog uh, prerogatives of private citizens on private semi-public. And it is certainly the case that someone's performing an act of civil disobedience, including trespassing, does not itself grant bystanders the right to use legal force against them. Looking for clear legal answers can only go so far amir, amir murky overlapping zones of public or and private. Analogies to other cases like that of George Zimmerman who had effectively self-deputized as a neighborhood watchman when, uh, when he killed Trayvon in a Florida subdivision in 2012, provide little clarity as far as the letter of the law is concerned. But this very murky gets precisely at the point. What the law says on paper is one thing. How things play out in practice is another. And the deeper structures of history that underwrite the gap between the law and practice are another matter, yet even still. Listening to the McCloskey's own statements and those of their lawyer, one cannot but be stuck, struck by certain phrases per their lawyer. Although melanin deficit are not racist and in fact support Black Lives Matter, the message of which they deem noble. What they are not capable of doing, their lawyer has explained, is embracing the object utilization of that noble message that we all need to hear over and over and over and over as the license to rape, rob, and pillage all over our rights. Did you hear that? Wow. Wow. Y'all hear that shade? Y'all hear that damn shade? <laughs> Y'all, these invocations of these menaces Woo! Rape, pillage, and in McCloskey's own repeated phrase, the mob rings at once hysterical and tin-eared in a state and country that praise noble savages even as lurid Im imaginary of sack homesteads were violated white womanhood inspired hideous acts of mass violence vigilante and ethnic cleansing
<clears throat> Even a cursory knowledge of an American history builds that the hour in all of our rights is unevenly applied. The explicit universal language in America founding documents has always been implicitly circumscribed by a racialized calculus restricting who actually can enjoy what the philosopher Hannah Arndt termed the right to have rights. As scholars like Caroline Light have distinctly shown the history of America's self-defense laws that was meant that, de that defense of one's castle and person, however universal it may be, phrased have never in practice been universally enjoyed or employed. A history underscored by clear empirical disparities in how the stand your ground and justify homo justifiable homicide cases are handled by police and juries today. Likewise, it is strikingly how in many cases defenses of the McCloskeys, the question of what exactly private property means is really kind of slippery. Is it their private property? Is it the private property of Portland Place Homeowners Association of which they are members? Or is it the idea of a particular order of private property in which first and foremost dependent on the prerogative of armed white people, civilians and otherwise to claim territory and dominate people above all unruly non-white people within it? Huh? Could that be? Unfolding in the microcosm of uh, for America, that is, a posh St. Louis gated community, the image of the McCloskeys, once absurd and menacing, reactivates distressed in historical truth. The ground on which Americans can equally claim to stand is not equally, actually equal at all. And it's not equally theirs. And in fact, it was stolen from some other people in the first place. The order of private property, which they, like so many, seek to defend today, is also one that fully accommodated owning other people as property. Huh. The traumatic legacies of these inconvenient truths, the building blocks, the origin story of racial capitalism, they don't go away just because many would rather not see them. You know what I'm saying? It just don't go away. It doesn't go away that y'all consider black people property and not human beings, but yet and still you can go down and have sex with them Give them babies, watch the baby grow up so you can sell it. Because you were that you as a group was that psychotic, you need to be charged in a court of law alone. To inflict that kind of psychosis on another group of people, to tell them that they're not human, but you can go down there and have sex with them, give them babies, and then sell the baby, and then pretend that that's not human. Is really says more about you and it indicts you more than it ever does anybody of, of, of color. It shows what kind of sick psychosis mind that, that, that you had to even make that a law and a doctrine. And for those who followed it, you are sick. And so for the most part, that's a lot of Caucasians that participated in that sickness. To call you property, but you can be down there having sex with property. Well, what a mind screw. <laughs> McCloskey himself has described him and his wife renovation to their 18,000 square foot home as an Italian palazzo. 
built in 1909 by the son of beer magnet Adolphus Bush as making them urban pioneers. For all too many in a city defined by racial disparities and everything from zoning to income to life expectancy, this choice of words may ring at once inaccurate and all too true. The McCloskey's vision of homesteading, home defense, and entitlement to wave an entitlement to wave their guns in defense of property in general are not innovative at all. They merely present represent a very and very ugly return to the true form of what they've always been here. Wow. Patrick Bland wrote that article, and he's an associate faculty member at Brooklyn Institution Institute for Social Research. His book is called Gun Power. It's the structure of American violence, and it's going to be released in the spring of 2021. All right, y'all. I wanted to share that article with you. I'll see you in the next video.